It's called Prayer, and I've selected just two verses out of countless verses in the Bible. One from the Old Testament, one from the New. So let's look at the Old Testament lesson. It's the fourth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, verse 7. It's a wonderful rhetorical question that we can treasure the answer to. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him? What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to Him? And then from the New Testament, one verse, the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 17, pray continually. The King James Version says, pray without ceasing. Pray continually. This is God's word to us. May he bless it to our understanding. Let's bow our heads. O oh Lord our God, we thank you for the privilege of praying to you and for the instructions you've given us in the Bible about how to pray and particularly this morning as we think about when to pray. Write these words in indelible ink upon our hearts that we might be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. When was the last time you went to the doctor for a checkup? When you went last week or two weeks ago or last month or two months ago, the doctor asked the nurse ahead of time to take your temperature. The reason the doctor did that is because he wanted to know if you were sick. And in a spiritual way, all of us have a fever. We're sick. And prayer is one of the primary ways that God heals us. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, Jesus said, but the sick. And we need to go to Dr. Jesus regularly for a spiritual checkup. How often we pray is a good indicator of our spiritual fitness. Because we're in a relationship with the divine physician. We have to tell the doctor what's going on in our lives. And then we need to listen to what he says to us because here's the cure. That communication is vital. If you go and see the doctor and you just sit there and when he asks you questions, you just grunt, he doesn't know what's going on. If you close your mouth and won't let him stick the thermometer in, he's not going to know how much of a fever you have. When do you pray? Like I asked the kids just a few minutes ago, the Bowers children gave good answers. They're wonderful answers. We pray before we eat. We pray before we go to sleep. We pray in church. There's more to it, though, than that. And the Scriptures encourage us to pray continually. An older Christian I know told me this week that she defines prayer as talking to God throughout the day. I really like that. It's very simple and it's very biblical. Which leads us to Paul's advice regarding prayer. Specifically as it comes to us in 1 Thessalonians 5. Paul says we're to be praying 24-7. How is that possible? That's what I want us to think about this morning. At the end of his very first letter, Paul gives the Christians in Thessalonica some final instructions. And this is an interesting bit of instruction because we believe this is Paul's first letter. So we have this window into life in the early church. What was it like for those Christians shortly after the time Jesus has been crucified, has been raised, and has gone to heaven. What was it like for them? And I think the apostles' rules here are really 
simple and timeless. They're timeless. These rules apply to our lives together as well. I want you to note some of the verbs and adverbs Paul uses. You know, my dad was an English professor, and I was raised to pay attention to verbs and adverbs, adjectives, and all of those kinds of things. And so as I looked at this, I noticed these particularly. Fill in the blank in your sermon notes. Respect those who are the leaders in the church. Live in peace with each other. Be patient with everyone. Is patience one of your virtues? Probably not. Few of us have that virtue. Yet we have instructions here to work on that. Paul says, always try to be kind to each other and to everyone else. Always, even when they tick you off, even when they're not doing what you want them to do. Always be kind to each other and to everyone else. So he's saying to each other in the church and then outside the church, even when you get cut off in traffic, even when you're at this 240, I-40 mess that they're working on and it's better, but it ain't fixed. Be joyful when? Always. Not just when things are going your way. Always be joyful. You can always be filled with the joy of God even when you're not happy. And then the big one here for today, pray continually. In other words, never stop praying. You can have your eyes open, you can have your eyes closed. The idea is that you're constantly talking to God. Give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. Not just those that you're happy about. Not just those that you think others are happy about. James Quillen used to say, griping and complaining makes you feel good for a little while, but in the end it does nobody any good. Especially you. And then Paul says, hold on to the good. Hold on to it. Hold on to it tight. As we were singing in the song, God is a good, good Father. And we're loved by Him. Hold on to that truth. Never let it go. Let's dive in a little deeper on this idea of praying continually. How is it possible to pray without ceasing? I think it's sort of like this older friend told me this week. It's talking to God throughout your day because you realize that you're always in His presence. You never leave His presence. We feel it in a very special, particular way in this sanctuary. But God does not live in here unless you're here. When you leave, He goes with you. Wherever you go, you're in His presence. Praying continually is possible when we realize God is always with us. So let me ask you, and I'm asking myself, when can we pray and when should we pray? These are some of my uh, directions that, that I feel strongly about, but you could add to this list, and I hope you will. When can we pray? When should we pray? The first one I've got on here I do think is number one. It is the most important. When we reflect on God, on who He is, that good, good Father, He loves us. He'll never, ever let us go. And when you reflect on that throughout your day, you're praying to God, you're talking to Him. He's listening and He's responding by reminding you of what this old book says. When can we pray? When we need help. We're good at that one. No atheists in foxholes. We know to pray to God instinctively when we need help. When someone we love needs help, we need to pray. When someone we love is hurting, when someone we love is struggling, when someone we love is sick, grieving, we need to be praying. And we don't need to just say to them, I'm praying for you, we need to actually do it. It's one of the things our deacons are masters at doing. They go out and they really pray for people in the hospital, in the nursing
nursing homes. When can we pray? When should we pray? When we need guidance. And we always need guidance. We may think we've got this thing called life figured out, but we don't. I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how smart you are, whatever. You haven't figured it out until you enter the pearly gates. You need guidance. Pray for it, and God will give it. When can we pray? When we're grateful. We should stop whatever we're doing and just inside our minds, thank God for all He's done for us. You can do that anywhere you are, anytime. Be grateful. And then we ought to pray when we're not grateful. Perhaps even more so then. When we're complaining and murmuring and griping and as my grandmother used to say, when we're having a pity party, that's when we especially need to be praying. And that communication with God will literally lift you out of that hole and bring you into the presence of the one who's given you so much. When can we pray? When we're forgiven. Do you know that you're forgiven of your sins? When you trust Jesus Christ, it's as if God takes the eraser on that dry erase board, or back in my day, the blackboard, and erases it. And then somebody comes in and washes it away so that you don't see any of the residue. Thank God for that. Tell Him you're grateful. And when we need to forgive someone, we need to pray. There's that mysterious connection between God's forgiveness of our sins and our forgiveness of other people's sins. When we need to forgive, we need help with that. I need help with that. When someone hurts me or hurts my kids, I need help from above to forgive them. When do we need to pray when we doubt? Is it okay to doubt? Yeah, it's, it's part of the human experience. One of the twelve disciples was known as Doubting Thomas. He didn't always understand what was going on. When we doubt, we shouldn't just keep it all to ourselves. Tell God about it. Go to His Word about it. When should we pray when we're tempted? It's a big part of the Lord's Prayer, that simple prayer that Jesus taught His disciples. When we're tempted, we should say, God, I know this is wrong. And your conscience tells you what's right and wrong. You have no doubt. You may stuff it down, but you know right and wrong. And when we're tempted, we should say, God, I've got to have some help with this. It's the principle of AA and 12-step programs. They call a friend. Call God. Tell Him, and He will help you. When should we pray when we've been delivered from evil? And this is an evil world. There's a lot of evil going on. And God delivers us regularly. We need to acknowledge it. The devil is on your back. He's after you. And God delivers you from Him every single day. Thank Him for that. And kind of as a summary, when should we pray? When can we pray? Whenever. Whenever. That's what Moses was inspired by God to tell the Israelites long ago. What other nation is so great as to have their gods, lowercase g, did you get that? They're not real. Near them the way the Lord our God is near us, so close whenever we pray to Him. When do you pray? Let's bow our heads and do just that right now. Almighty and everlasting God, You who put the stars in the heavens and the planets in their orbits, You who've given us life, breath, hope, peace, salvation, eternity. We love You and we thank You for first loving us more and more, may our communication with you be perpetual. May it never stop. 
May we see prayer as being with you, talking to you throughout our day. In the name of your Son, Amen. As we sing this last hymn, I want you to join me and to place your pledge card on the Lord's table. I meant to say at the first of the service there are extra pledge cards out in the table uh, in the narthex. So let's uh, sing our praises to God and give Him thanks for this great congregation. The hymn we'll be singing this morning is hymn 284 in your hymnal. 284 in your hymnal. They'll know we are Christians by our love. I'll give you a few minutes. I know it was a typo in the bulletin. But 284. And let us stand together as we sing. promises to us through your son that that he would rise again from the dead not only in reality but in in symbolism that likewise we would rise from the dead as well because he had paid the penalty for our sins and so lord we reap the harvest of the benefit of your promises to us and so this morning lord we have made promises to you 
that we will support this church and its ministries in the year ahead. And we pray, Lord, that we will be as faithful in fulfilling our promises to you as you have been to us, that you might be glorified here and around the world through the ministries of Highland Heights Presbyterian Church. For we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. When Barb and I were younger, early marrieds, we would sometimes have to make a large commitment to buy a car. Not very often a new car, but to buy a car. We needed a car, and we would sign on the dotted line for the car, being thrilled with having the car, but knowing now there is an obligation each month out there to pay for that car. And it was kind of a burden around our necks. But for more, more than 40 years now, we have paid our tithes to the Lord. And never once has it seemed a burden. Indeed, it is our promise to the Lord that we will seek in some small, sometimes pathetically small way, to fulfill our promises to him as he has filled his, fulfilled his promises to you and to me. As you have turned in and may yet turn in your pledges, may you be filled not with a sense of obligation, but a sense of this is my precious opportunity to fulfill my promise to the Lord and go into this world in peace have courage, hold on to what is good, honor every person, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, share the gospel, love and serve our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.